All right. So uh, chapter three, we all read that. Or uh, yeah, it's chapter three. Um, the youth and, and I just uh, a week ago, uh, we went through the life of Martin Luther with a, a classic 2003 film now um, just called, I think it's just called Luther. And um, we're going to travel much of the same ground except for uh, with, with greater depths and, and greater insights. So this entire discussion today is going to be on the leading reformer, Martin Luther. And in trying to divide up... Um, the, the major points or the major headings. It's all based around Martin Luther's lifetime. And um, we'll take a look at some of the 95 theses. We'll try to reflect on exactly what they say, do a little bit of analysis together. Um, but we'll begin with his early life, move on to his monastic life, focus specifically on the 95 theses for a little while. Then we'll talk about um, the many controversies that followed thereafter. And then finally, we'll um, talk about his later years. And so um, let's get started without further ado. I'll just briefly show you this, this timeline overlapping Luther and Calvin. We'll look at Calvin in great depths um, uh, next week, or rather next time we meet, which is going to be a little while. Um, but you can see that their lives overlap somewhat significantly. But Calvin, he is really coming on the scene when, um, well, he's getting born when Martin Luther is 30. And... Um, the 95 Theses are um, being nailed to uh, Wittenberg Castle Church when John Calvin's just an eight-year-old. So Calvin comes into the world with a reformation that's already begun by Martin Luther. And um, we'll see that when we, we talk about him uh, to come. But I, I place their lifetimes right next to one another because really these are the two major reformers. And, and frankly, when it comes to the branches of the Reformation, and the different churches that are birthed from the Reformation, you have those that, that come from Luther and essentially those that consolidate around Calvin. That's really what you got. And that's why I put them up uh, with their overlapping lives. But Luther, you'll notice, he, he, he lives, or rather is born and he dies in, in Eisleben, which is um, pretty close to Erfurt, Germany, probably one of the bigger cities. Um, and his whole life is kind of really spent in the vicinity of uh, these places in uh, central Germany. And um, you'll notice that Luther really does not have a robust writing career. I mean, really the 95 Theses, he, he has some commentaries before this, you name it, but really his, his writing career explodes thereafter. And I just think it's interesting to note that makes Martin Luther what? 1483 to um, 1513, he'd be 30. And 1517, he'd be, you know, 34 years old by the time he really begins writing. And his life is marked by a great deal of internal conflict and things like that before then. Um, he doesn't get married till much later in life to Catherine von Bora. But this is true. You're going to see of many of the reformers that they don't get married till much later, either because they began as monks or because they're preoccupied with education and writing and learning and things like that. Um, but we'll try to talk about each of these major points and so many others as we go through his story. So let's begin. Martin Luther, born in Eisleben. I think I have a map. Uh, let's see. I, I don't think I... Lutherstadt, Eisleben. There we go. So right here is where the story begins. And um, we're really looking at Saxony and Anhalt. If you know um, your map of Germany, we'll zoom out so you can see Germany much, much bigger and see where this sort of stuff is at. But he's born in Eisleben to Hans and Margaret Luther. And his father is a, a copper mining baron. I mean, he's, he's fairly well to do, and therefore he's able to get involved in city politics. We talked in our very first lecture about how this world that people live in, you're kind of locked into a station in life just by virtue of the economic class of your parents. And you'll see both Luther and Calvin are born into families that are um, you can't even use a phrase like upper middle class because that didn't exist, but they're kind of on the verge of being part of the aristocracy. Um, so they're well to do, which is this already puts you in the one or 2% of society who has access to more than your neighbor does. Um, 98, you know, percent of society is going to live in squalor, um, something like that. So he does have an upper hand. And um, his father even, even has some sort of role in public affairs, which, again, you know, that definitely indicates that, that he's, he's doing better than the next guy, probably. Yeah? What's copper mining? 
Oh, sorry, copper, C-O-P-P, my bad. <laughs> Good, job. Good job. If anyone was going to get it, it'd be you, Scott. It'd be you. All right. But his father is determined that Martin Luther should become a lawyer. Um, that's th the path that his father sets out for him. Again, very interesting. It's the exact same thing with John Calvin. Um, it's a lucrative career. You can get married. <laughs> that's nice unlike anything that you do with the clergy. And um, that's what his father sets him up for. And this sets him down a course of education. And you would begin school um, at a young age if you have the opportunity. Most people wouldn't really be educated at all. So he goes to Mansfeld, which is um, pretty close, close by. And um, he goes there for his, his, the beginning of his education, the beginning of his learning. And so at that time, you'd be doing the trivium, um, you know, uh, grammar, logic, rhetoric. And um, you'd be getting exposed to all of those things. Moves on to Magdeburg, which takes him, again, not too far away. So he's living in roughly the same area. And I, the farthest he goes from home is going to be to Eisenach. And here he's still really doing all of the sorts of things that you'd be doing in your undergraduate to just verging into college studies. So we're talking about... Um, you know, private schools for, for boys and teenagers and into young adulthood. But in 1501, Martin Luther ends up at the University of Erfurt, which is really kind of the big city around all of this stuff. This is kind of the, the center of it all. And it's very important. We talked in our first and second lecture about this thing called the Via Moderna. And particularly associated with it would be, uh, I, I guess I don't put Beale up here again, but a particular preacher of the concept that we, we saw last time we met, which is God essentially gives grace to those who do everything that they can, who do all that's in their power to grow in um, graces and virtues and to pursue salvation. And Beale is one of the great preachers of the Via Moderna in the world at that time. He is preaching your need to pursue righteousness and holiness, not as a result of your salvation, but in pursuit of it. And exposure to that teaching is going to make for Martin Luther this sense from uh, perhaps even before then, but certainly by his time at the University of Erfurt, this sense that God is a judge to be feared and a judge before whom no one can really be quite certain that they've done enough, that they measure up, and that they have a salvation before him. And this is kind of the picture of God that is um, being cultivated for Martin Luther. Do you have another question, Scott? Well, Moderna, so why that? Yeah, well, the, via Moderna, so the, the modern way, um, it was married to certain philosophical movements that we had talked about, particularly voluntarism and the idea that, that God can, he has the freedom to erect um, uh, otherwise seemingly arbitrary hoops to jump through to gain his approval and gain, gain his favor. And it played into the system of sacramental penance that, um, that well, it was widely recognized at the time. And so the, the various Luther stocks, mm -hmm. uh, obviously Luther was there. Was what it means like is that there. these cities are now, if you ever went there today, they're basically museums. Like if you go there... They're massive tourist, uh, tourist attractions. And so basically you have three cities called Lutherstadt. I mean, which, which just means in Germany, it's like, this is the town Luther was born in. This is the town where Luther went to school. Um, and I've been to Lutherstadt Wittenberg and um, you know, I've, I've walked up and down the streets there and there are statues of Luther and Melanchthon. And as you'll see the great, um, uh, illustrator at the time who would create the political cartoons. I mean, and it's amazing. It's really cool. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's also really sad because, I mean, there are so few people who believe anything that Luther taught living anywhere near those regions in Germany today. So it, I'll just tell you, when you go to Germany, every church you go into is raising money. And you'd be like, oh, you know, we might be thinking like this is for missions or missionaries. And it's always like, you know, give us money to help restore this historical artifact. And it's just, it's disturbing to go in because that's really kind of what they're about now. But I loved it because I got to see all these, you know, old Luther things. And I'll mention some along the way. But in any case, um, 
It's in 1505 that uh, Luther has the great thunderstorm experience. And Luther is convinced that he's under the wrath of God when he's in a thunderstorm. And um, he almost gets struck by lightning, or at least it's close enough to where he's pretty convinced he almost got struck by lightning. And that drew out of him, in this thunderstorm experience, a, um, a vow uh, to, to pursue monasticism and to pursue um, you know, uh, religious learning and, 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 and theology and things like that, but to, to essentially be a monk and to uh, walk this most strict and narrow path it, hoping to gain the favor of God. And so th- this is a huge turning point in his life. He decides to be a law school dropout, which you can imagine his father, his, his mother, probably not very pleased with, as that was the course that they wanted to send them on. And they undoubtedly paid a lot of money to get him to go to school. And um, at that point in his life, he really, he sees the weakness of human reason um, as, as a major, major problem, that, that human reason doesn't compare at all to uh, learning directly from God theologically and directly from his word. And you can perhaps see why. I mean, you'd have moral philosophers like Plato and especially Aristotle, who had, you know, written vast treatises on ethics and what it means to be virtuous and an ethical man. But you're sitting there reading this going, well, but does God, is this really what God requires of me? And is this going to please God? Is this going to pacify the judge that I'm going to stand before? And when you're really, really, really pressed with this, and you're struggling with guilt, and you're struggling with uh, the idea that you could ever please God, you can understand why at some point you throw Aristotle over your shoulder and say, Nicomachean ethics is hard to read, first off. And second off, like, is this really the standard? And so this is a big turning point for him as well. And so this monastic vow, July 2nd, 1505. And the cool thing about Luther's life is that, I mean, it's so, other, it's so well documented that it's like you can walk step by step through his life and um, date by date, really. And so he goes to St. Augustine's monastery on July 17th, 1505, and that's where he begins his monastic career. And it's important we all know what this means for him is he's never going to be married. This is what you're thinking. You're never going to have a family. You're going to live an austere life of discipline in um, a uh, community of other monks. You think about that too, just annoying people. I mean, it's just you're going to have to work with them, be near to them all the time. You're going to have a superior Someone who you answer to, authority is a huge thing in the monastic system. And someone that um, is is the person who you don't say no to when they ask you to to take any particular course or do anything. This is what you're signing up for. And in Luther's mind at this time in his life, this is the whole system that we talked about two weeks ago, where this is my best bet at doing all that I can and pursuing um, God's pleasure with me through um, this life of obedience. Yes, Scott. So it's a rather dramatic picture. Is the owl symbolism deliberate? Mm. You're asking the really important questions, I see. No, I don't believe so. I just went on the internet and found a picture of a bolt of lightning, and that's what I found. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yeah. yes, you can rest assured the pictures are probably not that well thought out. But monastic life. Settling into this monastic life, um, he, he's in a season of spiritual despair. That's why he got there in the first place. Thinks God's after him. He's under the wrath of God in a season of spiritual despair. And Johann von Staupitz is going to be his superior. This is the guy he has to answer to. Unfortunately, Staupitz has a, a very practical mind, and he, he also has a very pastoral spirit. And this is probably of... Um, unspeakable importance in Luther's life. Who knows if we would have the Luther that we have today, um, if he would have had a more, uh, say, rigorous, cruel, sometimes you get those superior in a monastery. They're just there because the same reason you're there, they're just trying to do all that they can. And unfortunately, it's not much because they just, they're not a very pleasant person. But fortunately, that's not the case with Staupitz. And, you know, the classic story, I mean, of Luther just confessing sin and after sin after sin. And if you're a highly introspective person, you can imagine if you actually tried to examine yourself all day as to whether you've been a little bit lazy 
or as to whether or not you've indulged in a bit of un unwarranted self-pity, or if you have um, in any way cheated your employer. You know, you just literally try to think through your day as to whether or not you're living out the commandments. Well, that's Luther times 10. And, you know, there have been people who tried to analyze Luther as to whether or not he had different disorders, whether he had um, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, these sorts of things where you just, you obsess over things and you can't, can't quit thinking about it. And, you know, Staupitz, you know, as the story goes, when he was confessing, it was like Luther, you just, you come here again and again and again. And he's like, I never hear anything even interesting from you. Like you're just, you're confessing these, you know, <laughs> these very, very, uh, faint sort of sinful dispositions as opposed to like you never punished anybody, you never actually stole anything. And we make this distinction in the Westminster Confession too. We talk, talk about sinning in thought, word, and deed. And there really is kind of a gradation there. You know, we talk about the seriousness of sin. I um, can't remember the question number in the shorter catechism, but you know, are all transgressions of the law equally heinous? And they're not. I mean, in terms of their effects on other people, they're not. In terms of separating you from God, any unholiness is sufficient. But we, we can all be serious here and say, yes, you know, the axe murderer is, is committing more heinous crimes than the guy who realizes mid-workday that he's not doing all that he can to, you know, give his best effort. And, um, you know, just confessing multiple sins of thought and heart, they're, they're not any of the less sin. But I'm just saying that's where Luther was at at the time, and he was really shackled by it, um, you know, unable to make any progress as he saw it. So von Staupitz actually suggests that Luther begins studying the mystics, mystical theologians. You guys remember when we mentioned Bar Bernard of Clairvaux, class number one. And, and, and the thing is that the mystics at least emphasized a religion that got away from mere formalism. That is to say, it emphasized the religion of, of union with the Lord and, and, and fellowship with him deeply and spiritually in your soul versus just a life of pure rote repetition of, um, of various uh, spiritual disciplines, exercises, and, you know, just self, um, <laughs> you might say, uh, what is it you call that, self um, I don't want to say har flagellation, you know, harm and, you know, just working hard all of the time. And Luther did confess that that, that was a sort, there was a sort of value in that for him. Um, the problem was, was that the mystical path to fellowship with God was also very difficult and austere. Um, I don't know if anyone in this room has ever had like a moment where they felt um, something akin to a religious experience. They felt kind of the overwhelming presence of God. I can think of times in my life, very specific times when I felt that way. But here's the thing. I've noticed, number one, that you have very little control over when you have any sort of such experience. You can spend all day in prayer and not feel like at the end of it, you had a particularly wowing experience with the Lord. You could also just have something strike you that you never expected and you just feel overwhelmed by the Lord's presence. And so mysticism, which emphasized mystical union, a sort of union of your soul immediate with God in a rapturous state of, of fellowship with him and, and, and love for him and, and with him, it can be kind of crushing because you can engage those sorts of spiritual disciplines and go at the end of it, I actually feel horrible about myself because I actually feel, feel myself loving God the less because I'm, you know, A, it's taking so long. B, I'm just getting bored. I mean, <laughs> you're right back where you were before. And that's the challenging thing about mysticism. And we have our own versions of this as Protestants. You know, we have um, things that are supposed to induce deep experience. Usually they're retreats and things like that. And you kind of feel worse if you go to the retreat and, you know, you don't feel any closer and everybody else does. And you're like, I guess I don't fit in, you know, something's wrong with me. And um, so, so I think we have certain points of connection on this. But what Staupitz does say is you need to immerse yourself in the study of the word. And for us as Protestants, this really is super meaningful to us because we talk about the ordinary means of grace. God has left us things that don't involve 
uh, a pilgrimage to a distant city. Uh, it, they don't involve climbing the tallest mountain and, you know, meeting the Dalai Lama at the top of it. He's given us ordinary means of grace, and the reading of the Word is right at the heart and center of that. And isn't it crazy that essentially a monk, a man really fearful that he's not pleasing to God, <laughs> never really thought of that? Why? What world do we live in where you go, <laughs> maybe studying the Word directly might induce for me a love for God and a deep sense of His love for me? And this is great practical advice on the part of Staupitz. And so he does uh, um, embrace that, um, that particular piece of advice, and this begins his academic life. Um, he begins to make academic progress in pursuit of the priesthood. I mean, if you're going to go and you're going to study theology, it really isn't like today where it's like, hey, I'm just going to get a PhD in theology and not be in the ministry. That was pretty much nobody. If you're going to pursue divinity, first step is you're going to get ordained. And he does that, and so he gets ordained, and usually at your ordination or somewhere very near it, you'd perform your first mass, and you do it in Latin. Um, and that's what the language in which you do all your theological study at that time. Nothing would be written in your mother tongue. You do it all in Latin. So in 1507, um, that is when he gets ordained, and now, um, you know, it's it's... Uh, whether it be Friar Luther or something like that, or um, actually priest, I think he'd have to have a specific call to have that title, but he's now at least an ordained minister of sorts. And so in 1509, that's two years later, he obtains his bachelor's degree in Bible. And it's during this time that he has his infamous trip to Rome. Someone thinks it's going to be a good idea for Luther who is otherwise, and it might have been, uh, not, I don't know if Stapitz is following him at this point, it might have been, but they decide Luther, who's you know, always had this struggle in his conscience about whether he saved, it'd be good for him to take a trip to Rome. He essentially had to go there to, to bring some sort of message or something to Rome that um, just had to be done. And their thought is, this is really going to be um, something that furthers his spiritual life. He's going to be built up and encouraged by this, and he's going to grow that much more because they're seeing progress already, and they're like, next step. It's just, this is, this is the medieval version of a retreat. So you're going to Rome, and when he gets there, he is absolutely appalled. You think you're going to the holy city. Well, it's, it's, it's the complete opposite. He discovers that there in Rome, is this project to rebuild St. Saint, Saint Peter's um, Basilica. And, you know, he's coming from a place of squalor. He sees squalor all over Rome. That's people who um, just have almost nothing, and they're busy building this crown jewel, this gem in the middle of the city. And the contradiction overwhelmed him. He also saw just the overwhelming hypocrisy of so many priests involved in scandalous behavior. It, it's like an experience that you might have if you ever find yourself at a Christian school, if you decide to go to a Christian university, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I went to a Christian university, and, um, you know, you go there because you're looking for Christian fellowship, and you're thinking, hey, there's gonna be a lot of Christian people here. Well, sometimes that's the case. Sometimes it's not, and you go there, and you're like, these people are way worse, like, then if I just went to University of Washington and, and, and did Reform University Fellowship or something like that, these are the sorts of experiences you can have in, in your Christian life. And so to Luther, this is actually a huge chink in his conception of what the church is and um, in the holiness of the church. So he comes back to Wittenberg in fi uh, 1511. That's where he's, he's doing his academic work now. And he ends up pursuing his doctor in theology, obtains it by 1512. And um, I mentioned at this early stage, Andreas von Karlstadt, who I believe was either his doctoral examiner or he was an advisor. He, he's wrapped up in, in Luther's uh, doctor in theology. Karlstadt has many similar ideas as Luther, but Karlstadt is going to be part of a version of the Reformation that's called the Radical Reformation for a season. Um, they, they're going to be more violent, 
uh, in that they are going to literally be iconoclasts. They're going to go into churches. They're going to destroy any image that seems to be a graven Im- image and a, a transgression of the second commandment. They end up burning lots of things down, and they're closely associated with the peasants who eventually rebel about 10 years from now. And men like Karlstadt made it difficult to propagate the Reformation as a healthy and helpful thing. It scares the living daylights of the aristocracy everywhere and the people who oversee the knights and the people who can fight and can kill you. And so he's going to be one of those guys that in Luther's life, um, not every ally is necessarily a good ally. And um, Karlstadt, like I said, he actually, he, he comes upon certain ideas, arguably even before Luther does. And so he'll even kind of claim Luther as, you know, hey, pff, I'm really the guy behind Luther because he was more further, he was quite a bit further along and involved, like I said, in his obtaining of his doctoral degree in theology. So there is a, a, a representation of the sort of things that the radical reformers were doing. And, you know, when Luther, we'll, we'll see in a little bit, has to hide away from everybody in Germany, Karlstadt's going nuts, and they have to call him back to Wittenberg Luther, essentially, to put down um, these sorts of behaviors. And Karlstadt, what's interesting, I'll just I'll, I'll mention this as a sidebar, he ends, up, he ends up aligning more with the South German reformers, and eventually the people who make for the reform tradition and uh, the, the Calvinist tradition, really. And he also tones down his radical reforming behaviors. At the end of his life, he, om- he pretty well summarily repents of this behavior, and he becomes a farmer. And, um, you know, so that's there's a lot of humility in that. Um, but this is the sort of thing he was involved in before that time. And so um, we're still in the monastic life, but now that he's a doctor, Luther can begin lecturing. And he becomes a profoundly popular lecturer. Um, you just you know the difference between when you have a professor you can tell really loves what they're talking about and someone who you know they're just whether it's just their style or you know, their monotone or you name it. Luther is a guy who, when he's teaching, his students feel like you you live and breathe this. This is you. This is what you're all about here. And that was not necessarily the norm in the monastic world. There were a lot of people in a lot of different positions due to politics due to um, just rising up through the system and you, you, you're in that position and you don't know why. Well, Luther, this was where he was meant to be. And so he begins with Psalms. Uh, Romans because is, is a major, major part of Luther's life. And we'll talk about his Romans epiphany in a little bit here. Galatians. These are books that you think of as especially emphasizing justification by faith and uh, not by anything that you can do. And... Um, so Luther has, you know, four different series of lectures that he does between 1513 and 1517. And this is what is going to lead up to um, 1517. And of course, All Saints Day, October, well, back then it was November 1st, but because they had 30 day months. And so it's for us, October 31st. But um, his lectures are still avail- available on all of these, these books, which is just fantastic. So, you know, Luther's works, um, it's just this expanding project all the time because Luther wrote so much, but it's like 57 volumes right now. And you can get his, his lectures on, I have his lectures on Romans, a few volumes on Psalms. But he, you can tell, even in the Psalms, which is one of his earliest ones, the guy is already just a brilliantly insightful Bible interpreter. Already. Like, it's, it's very, very clear that he's a gifted and studious individual um, in addition to being someone who is, is passionate about what he's learning. And so here we have the 95 Theses, and we'll focus on these for quite a bit. The focus of over 50% of the 95 Theses is on the issue of the sale of indulgences. In that vast scheme of salvation that we described last week, and we talked about kind of the ladder going upwards to, um, you know, attaining beatitude and holiness and sainthood, essentially. The roadway there, the sacrament of penance, becomes the focal point of your Christian life. The bottom line is, if you've sinned, it must be confessed, and some sort of satisfaction has to be made for that sin, lest you suffer purgatory post-mortem penalty. 
And so the sale of indulgences is tied up with this guy, especially Johann Tetzel, the most famous and most successful of the indulgent salesmen. And Tetzel, here's the thing, even by the standards of the day, was way out there in what he was promising when it came to indulgences. Um, it would seem that Tetzel was even saying that if you had a deceased loved one who went to hell, say they committed a mortal sin, which in Roman Catholic theology, adultery, um, several different others, um, you, you're toast, you're done. Like if you die in that sin and you've not uh, performed some rite of penance prescribed you, you are, it is hopeless. Well, Tetzel was even saying that you could, if you paid enough, you could buy an indulgence to buy that family member out of hell. And this is the sort of thing that even the Pope, like the papacy afterwards would be like, well, he shouldn't have been saying that. They were not, however, objecting to the money that he was sending back to Rome to build St. Peter's, okay? So, I mean, it's kind of an ambiguous thing what Tetzel was doing, but yeah, he would tell people um, in all walks and stages of life, that the number one thing they should be concerned about, no matter how poor, no matter how impoverished, is that they stand to suffer flames in the hereafter. No matter how much they've, they lived a Christian life of, of principle or believed in Jesus, any of it. And therefore, they should allocate significant portions of their, of their income to purchasing these indulgences. And what an indulgence would mean, you, you'd actually get a certificate that said specifically something to the effect that you have paid this amount to remit, you know, post-mortem penalty. And the, the practice became so wildly abused is that you started having people purchasing these indulgences before they would sin. So you know that you've been uh, flirting with some woman who's not your wife, and you've been contemplating the worst, and you're like, well, I might as well buy some insurance before I engage in this, this sort of behavior. And this sort of thing would, would occur. Um, it would happen in a variety of ways across society. And um, it essentially became one of the most unholy religious practices you can imagine. You, you know, <laughs> there are those who have a truly bruised conscience that you're exploiting and you're taking their money and they might be impoverished. And then there are those who are a little bit smarter and they want to work the system. Maybe they're part of the aristocracy. They have some sort of belief in God and religion, and they go, well, I might as well hedge my bets. I'm going to, you know, uh, maybe engage in simony and, and purchase an office in the church. And I know that's not quite right, but I'll buy an indulgence, you know, to, to offset what I've done, and then I'll, I'll be good thereafter. And you can see how, how arbitrary this seems. But this is kind of the problem when you've, you've uh, abandoned Sola Scriptura. You've said that the church and her tradition and especially her officials are competing religious authorities right alongside of the Bible. You've put that much authority in the church and you go, well, maybe a strictly arbitrary uh, transaction can deal with my sin. And so that's the sort of thing that's going on at this time. So this is, uh, this is actually uh, the doorway to, to Castle Church now. And um, they have embronzed all of the 95 theses written on it. Yes. And so <laughs> I shared with um, the Breedenbergs when we watched the Luther movie a, a week or two ago, the minute you walk into Castle Church, the very first thing you see when you get there is a little concession stand selling Luther trinkets and 95 Theses paraphernalia and like, you know, like medieval hats and things like that. <laughs> it's inside of a church. I don't know if it strikes anyone as a bit ironic that this is the human condition, friends. You can take a man who, who risked his life to oppose the commercialization of the church into this economic powerhouse and what they did to honor that man is they turned the church into a tourist attraction that essentially sells things for nothing but secular gain. And so <laughs> this is the world we live in. It's also true that the, the front of the church, Luther and Melanchthon, are, uh, they're, they're entombed under the ground, but they have like statues of their tombs coming up from the ground with both Luther and Melanchthon laying right there. So at the front of the church, it's like... <laughs> It's, it's kind of the Luther Melanchthon, you know, uh, worship site. I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's bizarre. I mean, one of the, honestly, it's one of the most disappointing parts of my trip to Wittenberg that Heather and I took years and years ago. Um, but did anyone have any? Trinkets from there, right? 
<laughs> we did not buy a trinket from that. <laughs> we couldn't do it. Um, but do you have any questions for me up to this point, friends? Anything come to mind? Yeah. Be hard to nail the bronze, my friend. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -mm. Not the same. Anyone else? Yeah. So he started lecturing in, on like the Psalms and Romans and Galatians before 1517. So would yeah. you say that those works, I, I haven't read those works, but are they still like fairly Protestant theology? So they're like still worth reading? Yeah, it's actually a really great question. I mean, you d it's funny when you read Luther's early works, um, th there are a lot of things about which Luther is. Um, He's not settled on yet. So you'll, he'll, he'll, in passing, reference things like indulgences or penance as if they were genuine sacraments, and especially penance. And just in, it's just in his thought world at that time, it still is. It's still a normal part of the Christian faith, and you haven't, you haven't thought to question that at that point. So no, you're, it's, it's definitely not to the point. But here's the thing. When you're commenting on the Psalms, in general, you're not going to come up against that particular thing very much. And more often than not, he's going to berate those practices um, as just horribly abused and, and you name it. But at this point in his life, as you're going to see when we look at the 95 Theses, the jury's still out on the Pope. In fact, at this point, Luther is pretty convinced that the Pope probably is the head of the church. He's the head of Christendom. And you'll see that he's actually appealing in the 95 Theses to the better judgment of the Pope against the indulgent salesmen, kind of tacitly begging him to condemn it and to end it. So great question. Yeah. 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 He actually embraces that to the end. So um, many, yeah, many of the reformers, they, I mean, here's the thing. They'd say, um, we're going to reject tradition as something that's alongside of scripture and its authority, but it doesn't mean all traditions are false. So it's like, you know, tradition tells us Matthew was written first. I mean, you know, I mean, you can make arguments either way, but it's debatable. Um, but to say the least, the question about Mary at this point is not the, the focal point of the Reformation. They had enough fish to fry over here that there wasn't much of a point in taking up that particular battle at that point. It's a great question. All right, so let's jump into them and let's take a look at some of the 95 Theses. Okay, if you want one overarching theme, as to what the 95 Theses are about, it isn't that Rome is failing to preach justification by faith alone. It's actually that Rome is peddling a cheap form of repentance, false repentance that can be purchased with money, a false repentance with no real change of heart. In a way, what these Theses, the overarching sense is, is that Rome, in a sense, is too soft in saying to people, essentially, you're good, you're all right with the Lord, your sins are taken care of by mere monetary transaction. Don't get me wrong, he's going to talk about how they're too harsh too. And this is going to be the Protestant claim to Rome again and again and again. In a sense, they make salvation such a dry transaction and so much easier than what it really is, which is a real change of heart that can only be wrought by the Holy Spirit. In another sense, to a truly bruised conscience, they make everything so much harder because they heap upon you burden and it's the worst of both worlds is what they're going to argue essentially. But So this one, um, and I'll talk about Erasmus in a moment and Christian humanism and I'll give better definition of that. But thesis 36, any truly repentant Christian has a right to full remission of penalty and guilt even without indulgence letters. Truly repentant. A real Christian is someone who has genuine remorse in their soul, who turns to the Lord from that, asking for forgiveness. And Luther says here, and this is, this is as close to justification by faith alone as you're going to get in the 95 Theses, has a full right to remission of penalty. There doesn't have to be any indulgence letter at all. That is sufficient. But in a way, that is more difficult than what any human being can do whatsoever without the Holy Spirit operating in them. So this is where Luther is saying a real alteration of heart must come about by the Holy Spirit. If you're going to tell anyone, church, that their sins are forgiven, 
This is a major qualification on the sense of the right of the church when Jesus says, whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Luther's going to say, you cannot loose or forgive or set free anyone from the burden of their sin who is not truly repentant. And that's really what you're doing in this indulgence sales game. A wealthy aristocrat who wants to engage in all sorts of immoral behavior can show up with no repentance at all and say, I've got a big thick wallet and I can sin it up. And Luther's got a major problem with that. Now, this emphasis on repentance over penance, it's preceded by the brilliant work of Erasmus of Rotterdam. He is kind of at the forefront of what we would call Christian humanism. And um, Roland had asked me about this phrase. Christian humanism, that phrase actually was never used during the lifetime of the reformers. It was coined in the 18th, or excuse me, 19th century to describe a view of people, especially lower class people, as, as inherently valuable because, well, made in the image of God not inherently capable of saving themselves or saving the world, which is what secular humanism means. But people who, um, for example, religion has got to be able to make it to them in a meaningful way and be able to affect them in a meaningful way, or it's not genuine religion. This is the sort of thing that Erasmus would say, whereas the Roman system was so complex and complicated, no common man's heart could be stirred by it, thought people like Erasmus at the time. So Erasmus it began, and, and this is in the spirit of the Renaissance, he began going back to the original sources, to the original Greek, and he uh, produced a Greek New Testament that kind of compiled, you know, numerous uh, Greek New Testament manuscripts, which inspired people to begin studying the New Testament in Greek as opposed to Latin. This is going to have a vast, vast implication for all Christian theology from this point forward. Let me give you an example. This is what the Latin translation of Matthew 4.17, where it describes Jesus' inaugural ministry and what he was preaching. And your Latin translation would read this here. If somebody would read it other than Scott, who's always the person who reads it. Okay, this is how you would read Matthew 4.17. Jesus is a preacher of penance. Goodness, he's Johann Tetzel before Tetzel. Do penance. Do acts of satisfaction to satisfy for your misdeeds. This is Jesus as represented by the Vulgate. This is the good news that he's gone about preaching. Do acts of penance. This is what your ears would hear. This is what the Latin translation said. And this is what the Dewey Rhymes write to this day. This is a modern uh, uh, Roman Catholic translation of the Bible based on the Vulgate in English. This is what it says right here. Do penance. Well, this is what the New American Standard says and based on you know, the Greek text and not the, the Latin. Someone go ahead and read that. That's right. He says to repent. That word means a change of mind, an alteration of mind. You can see the word noet, noet, noetic, noete, noete, noete. It's right there. A genuine change of disposition and heart. That's what Jesus was preaching. Repent. Turn from your sins. Turn to me. It's a radically different thing. And when people start in mass studying the Greek New Testament, it shouldn't be surprising that you end up having radical fruits from these labors. Now, it's funny, Erasmus, he'll come up again and again, but Erasmus, he, he, he actually, he gets called a, a pre-reformer. He remains faithful to the Roman church, wanted to see um, reform from within. He's a sort of reformer, but he stops short of becoming a Lutheran or becoming reformed or you name it, but everybody pays their respects to Erasmus. You know, what's funny about Erasmus is when he produced his Greek New Testament, it was endorsed by Pope Leo X. He actually, in the preface, endorses it. He's like, hey, yeah, we should have study of the Greek New Testament. That'd be a great thing. So you get a papal endorsement before things heat up, which I think is re- really interesting. I love to point that out. But when people actually start reading it and drawing theological conclusions from it, not quite so excited about it, as we'll see. Yeah, Ben? 
Yeah. You know, that's a really good question, Ben. I mean, first off, you know, it's hard to say whether or not um, when uh, the early Latin translations are being drawn up by Jerome, if the word penance was as full of um, sacramental meaning as it came to be um, some 1,200 years later. So that word starts to become loaded in its meaning. But even from the beginning, it has a connotation of very specifically doing something to offset. Now, if you think about the concept of repentance, you're turning from a sin to something else, but that's, that's it. And it's an alteration of heart and an alteration of mind. But part of it is just, there's no simple, straightforward, straight across translation. Usually something is lost in translation. And that's why there's something valuable about any minister going back to original languages in the course of preaching to, <laughs> there's just gonna be nuance. And it's going to go into to other Greek words that we'll talk about as well. But it's a fair question. But that is what it came to mean by that time. It was, you couldn't read that word and not go, oh, the sacrament of penance. That's, that's the first thing you'd think of. All right, so let's take a look at another um, of the 95 Theses. Somebody else like to read this one? It's open to you, Scott. All right, so this right here is another instance, is a, a instance of Luther taking on indulgences. And he notices on street corners, in churches, in monasteries, all over the place, indulgences are being preached. What's not being preached is Jesus. What's not being preached or celebrated is the gospel that we read about in Scripture. And so for Luther at this point, just reading about who Jesus is and what he did, whether it be Jesus walking down the way and the man with leprosy saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And it says, and he was moved with compassion and he healed the man. Can you imagine how pleasant it'd be to hear about that guy instead of about indulgences? To just have Jesus preached and read his life and character, how, how soul um, freeing that would be versus the constant preaching of these means to simply get rid of and to remit sin that costs money. This is going to be the sort of thing that Luther is saying. And notice, notice what he says up here. It is certainly the Pope's sentiment that if indulgences, so on and so forth, Luther has this sense that the Pope would do better than what these representatives are doing. I mean, it's the kind of thing that we, we all think of. You, got, you see Antifa out on the street. If you have a more optimistic vision of the, the sort of political party that they tend to affiliate with, you'd be like, these guys are making those guys look bad, right? That's how you look at it. That's how Luther, he's, he still is a believer at this point in the right of the Pope. And he, this is clearly an appeal to him. He is actually being essentially the Pope's apologist, saying to the world around him, the Pope wouldn't like what you're doing. I'm pretty sure he wouldn't. And, um, you know, in a way, you know, as Luther gains, you know, popularity and the Pope is um, strangely silent to so much of this, that's where Luther is going to begin to, to make uh, more of a break with the Pope. All right, here's another instance of the issue of indulgences that's brought to the fore in the 95 Theses. Uh, thesis, thesis 46. Anybody? Christians are to be taught that unless they have more than they need, they must reserve enough for their family needs and by no means squander it on indulgences. It's a perfect example. This is a very real life thing that was happening. You know, you might have, what if you have a husband who has indulged in immoral behavior? He doesn't make a lot of money, but he's scared scared as can be that he's going to suffer flames for a, an undisclosed period of time after he dies. Well, his paycheck, whatever he gets that week, and again, for peasants, dude, it, it's unthinkable how little they had. But he spends his money that week and says, I think we can go a day without food. 
I'm going to buy an indulgence, so I'm good. You just think about how destructive to a household this would be. This is also the time period when the plague is going around. So the plague is alive and well in the world um, of the 16th century. So, you know, not a good time to be malnutritioned, not a good time to, uh, to not be able to take care of your family. There needs to be warm to even buy wood. As you're going to see in the Peasants' War, things were so terrible. Every forest was claimed by some lord or some part of the, the higher classes so that if you went into the woods and chopped down a tree and took wood home, you could be committing a crime. This is the world you live in. You have no means to make money. The basic resources of the land are off limits to you. And then you have the church herself preying upon you, the weakest and lowest in the society in pursuit of indulgences. And so just so you know, during this time, 1524 to 1525, this is four years after Luther stands before um, the Pope at the Diet, uh, excuse me, the, not the Pope, the Holy Roman Emperor at the Diet of Worms. War breaks out in Germany. The German Peasants' War, the, the, their condition was so horrible that they went to war with the powers that be and they got slaughtered. And at the time, you know, many people lumped Luther and the peasants together. They're both railing against authority, one civil, one ecclesiastical, and the thought was they're the same group. This is a really good warning to all of us if we have a tendency to lump people into the same group that are not. Luther absolutely did not want to be associated with the Peasants' Rebellion. In fact, the Reformation probably never would have gotten off of its feet if he had, because it was actually many of the lords and electors who were protecting Protestants like Luther. And so they had more religious principle than you might have thought. And the other thing is at the time, you know, in the world in which they lived, it's, it's like a lot of things. Change often isn't very easy. You might be able to look at any number of problems in society and be like, those things should change. And then go, yeah, but by the actual political system available to us, they're not that easily changed. And so it was in the world in which he lived. And he actually wrote a treatise, a fairly fam famous treatise, um, against the Peasants' War. He also defended the peasants in the sense that he said, look, these guys really do live in such utter destitute. They live in such horrific conditions. Every lord and every aristocrat in the land should be thinking about what they can do to help them. So he did have a word of protest in there, but he definitely did rebuke the peasants for essentially going to an impossible war. I mean, even when Augustine draws up his just war theory, one of the pieces of it is that you have any fighting chance of winning. Otherwise, you're, you're leading people to a, to a slaughter. And that's what happened in the Peasants' War. And Thomas Munzer was kind of their leader. He was their, one of their main leaders. And he was one of the radical, radical reformers. And they get associated with the Anabaptists, those who have the most radical revisions of theology. They're, they're kind of the precursors of like New Testament onlyist theology. Um, that's also where you tend, you know, you think about more Baptist-minded theology. They don't want to hear one word about how circumcision tells you anything about who should be baptized, or the Old Testament has no bearing on it. These guys were quite a bit more radical, and they weren't nearly as theologically sophisticated as what the Reformers are doing. They're not throwing out all development of theology. They're actually saying, we're building on this by going back to the, to the Greek text in the New Testament. So you have these other competing powers that be. You've got to understand when you see that why Luther would be the sort of person that people are like, man, is this guy crazy? Is he just like Thomas Munzer, just wants to start a war? Is he like Karlstadt, just wants to burn down churches? You can imagine how carving out, you know, who you are and what your movement is in that world would be very difficult and be very easy to lump you with radicals. So yeah, this is um, yeah, a, a representation of the Peasants' War. But I mean, it really is just, it's people who have at the very best, um, maybe farming equipment that they're using as weapons with people who have knighted armor on horses. It just, it was a total bloodbath. And, and at the end of the day, the peasants, they ended up gaining almost really nothing. I mean, they just, they were killed in droves. So this is going on in Luther's lifetime. This is a little bit after the point we're talking about in Luther's life, but that thesis points us to it. The other thing in the 95 Theses that's a major issue is papal power. 
um, it's linked to indulgences. Again, the reason why they're getting sold, one of the main reasons is because of this project to rebuild St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, Pope Julius II had employed Michelangelo, the great Renaissance artist, to, you guys know the stories, do all the paintings and the art inside of this basilica. It's to be rebuilt, it's to be rejuvenated, and um, this is the best in the world. This is, you just think about it, it's like this is the best the world can produce to make this the crown jewel of um, Christianity in the Western world. And so, Luther is essentially soliciting the Pope to clarify and to condemn this, past, this uh, practice of indulgent sales. At this point, frankly, if the Pope had even had a more conservative vantage point on it of like, hey, only sell indulgences to people who obviously have the money, they're not taking it from their family, make sure they're genuinely repentant, you can, you can give them this, this sheet that says they've been forgiven, but there needs to be a show of a real change of heart. I mean, to engage all that pastoral behavior is to really slow down the sales of these things. If he had done that, there's a chance that Luther may have been more of an ally than an enemy. And the sorts of things on the 95 Theses that Luther is going to say that's sort of chipping away at papal power is he's going to say that priests and their power to forgive is only declarative. Our Book of Church Order says the same thing about all of the ministry that pastors do. It's declarative. Here's what it means. Pastors can only declare forgiveness already spoken by God on conditions made by God. So I can say to anyone here, if you believe, you know, repent and believe in Jesus Christ, you'll be forgiven of your sins. I've done nothing but declare what the Word of God has said. What priests can't do, says Luther, is actually be the agent who bestows that forgiveness on someone, much less the agent who makes up random means for people to be so forgiven. That's the idea that you're not merely declarative, but you are the actual active power and source of conferring that forgiveness, and that's called sacerdotalism. It's the idea that a priestly people have an inherent power in themselves to bestow forgiveness, regeneration, ordination, all of these other things. And so we'll take a look at Thesis 32. I, I think I, I'm just referring back to, no, no, I'm not. I thought I was referring back to 46. But there, there is St. Peter's today. That's not cheap, just so you know. You guys are wondering. That's <laughs> not cheap. 32. Those who believe that they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will be eternally damned together with their teachers. That got Luther in trouble. <laughs> This, is, <laughs> this was one of the ones that, like, when you kind of, we're going to zero in on the 95 Theses and what maybe made Luther target number one, enemy number one of the church, this one, this one did. You think that you can be certain of salvation because you have an indulgence letter and no real repentance, no real faith in Christ together with our teachers. So there you go. Double line that one and bold it. Which one are you, Pope? Which one are you, Archbishop of the particular region which you know, Luther finds himself? And that's the sort of thing that when you pass this around via printing press, which is this newly invented thing, and you can mass produce this, is the internet before the internet. Um, everyone reading this is hearing of this monk out in Germany, out in Wittenberg, Declaring the eternal damnation of any teacher that you know who's teaching this up here. Might be your pastor. <laughs> Might be the Pope. Because he's the one who sent everybody out. And so this, this is seriously inflammatory. The other thing that Luther is going to be breaking down the logic of is purgatory. This we saw. Many, many theologians already doubted. You could, you could actually doubt or deny more freely that purgatory was a real thing had the conditions that maybe Rome was saying they had at the time. You could do that much more freely before the Reformation. We saw that the entire Waldensian tradition, we saw that um, uh, John Wycliffe and the entire group of people associated with him, they all denied purgatory. No one could deny that purgatory in the sort of you know, vast concept of this, this intermediary place between heaven and hell in the post-mortem state was not anywhere disclosed to you in the Bible. You really had to ask where this came from. And it was altogether clear that it wasn't a very developed concept um, before at least the 10th century. 
And so even today in Eastern Orthodoxy, which tends to freeze theology more around like the sixth, really more like the eighth and ninth centuries, they have a very ambiguous doctrine of, of the afterlife. You still pray for the dead, but no one quite knows what they're doing and what's going on. But somehow the spiritual battle in this life persists into the life that comes. And so, but they, they don't have a doctrine of purgatory like Rome does. So, for example, let's look at these ones. I'll read one. This unbridled preaching of indulgences makes it difficult even for learned men to rescue the reverence which is due the Pope from slander or the shrewd questions of the laity. He's talking about the preaching of indulgences and the fact that the Pope is in a position where he can be easily slandered and the question of indulgences is directly related to purgatory because that's the thing that you're supposed to be freeing yourself from if you're a Christian who's committed a venial sin when you purchase an indulgence. You're not going to go to hell if you've committed a venial sin, but you're going to spend time suffering and satisfying. Thesis 82 says, such as, and these are the sorts of questions, why does not the Pope empty purgatory for the sake of holy love and the dire need of the souls that are there if he redeems an infinite number of souls for the sake of miserable money with which to build a church? The former reason would be most just, the latter is most trivial. He's saying you have this power, this is the doctrine, to simply forgive you have this right to do this. You, can, you have the keys to the kingdom. You can open the door. You can shut the door. And you can even make up things on the basis of which to do it. Why not just let everybody out of purgatory, out of holy love? Why not? The same doctrine is married to the idea that there's this reservoir of righteousness or merit at the disposal of the Pope to simply give the merit of Mary, of the saints, and of Jesus, who has how much merit? Infinite merit. Why not take all of that infinite merit and just let all of these poor people who are busy buying indulgences, why well, just set them all free? And the logic, it was just, it's too powerful to say, and, and exactly why not? Why not? If you're able to do that. And so this is the sort of thing that, you know, and again, the Pope is directly implicated in this. Why doesn't the Pope, why doesn't he do this? He's got the power to, everybody ascribes it to him. So after the writing of the 95 Theses, this is when things really begin to heat up for Luther. And it heats up fast, like wildfire. This gets passed around. It's after the writing of the 95 Theses that Luther really comes to a definite idea of justification by faith alone. It's actually hard to date when he has his Romans epiphany. But it is the concept of imputed righteousness or righteousness accounted to or counted to you rather than righteousness that is inherently developed in you. This is a radical, radical difference from what people are thinking at the time. And it's based on Romans 1, 16 and 17, the opening of Romans, where Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Luther could not understand why it would be good news, gospel, for the righteousness of God to be revealed. In Luther's mind, a righteous God is terrifying. If a righteous God is the God that we serve, he's the sort of being who would look at you and me and rightly say, you're all sinners and you don't deserve to be in heaven. How is that good news? Well, Luther and his increasing acquaintance with the New Testament comes to understand that this word group, which has the root dik from dikai, for dikaiao, which means to justify, or dikaiosune, which means righteousness. This word group belongs to a legal sphere. It doesn't belong to a sphere of energy, motion, or power, and righteousness being infused in you. And that this is what this passage therefore means, for in it, the righteousness from God is revealed, from faith to faith, a righteousness that God gives to those who are faithful and who advance in it in faith. It is a righteousness that is counted to people rather than a righteousness required of people. Or better yet, it's a righteousness accounted to people in place of a righteousness required of people. And this is the idea of justification by grace alone through faith alone. And to be honest with you, 
it is so obvious that that word group means that to anyone who understands the Greek language, that it was just, it was flatly undeniable. Erasmus had already come up on ideas like this in his own work with the Greek New Testament, but fleshing out how important this is to humanity to know this good news, that there is a righteousness from God that he can clothe us with and count to us so that we're perfectly righteous in his sight apart from anything we buy or apart from anything we do. This changes everything. And this is going to be the thing that Luther, when he finally does stand before the Pope, and he refuses to recant and to retract, it's bound up for Luther, not just with the idea that repentance needs to be real and spiritual, but it's bound up now with the gospel that he goes, we can't sacrifice this at all. This is what the whole thing is all about. Luther's closest associate is Philip Melanchthon, and um, this is Luther's account of what he discovered when reading Romans, Melanchthon is going to be a, a profound theological developer of this idea. Luther actually said Melanchthon was the better theologian than he was, um, and a more precise theologian. But what Luther says about this experience, this moment, there I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous live, lives by a gift of God, namely by faith. And this is the meaning. The righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel, namely the passive righteousness, not something you do, but something you receive passively, with which the merciful God justifies us by faith. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through the open gates. The door of heaven is just flat out open to me now. There is no set of hurdles or hoops to jump through. In Christ, it's just open. In all these verses you read in John where it's like, he who believes in me has eternal life. Eternity began for you. You have it. All of it begins to make more sense. And so Luther, Melanchthon, and the other associates of um, you know, the early, what would become the Lutheran movement, this is at the heart and soul of what it means to be Protestant. When we talk about the historical roots of the PCA, this is at the heart and soul of what it means to accept the gospel in our church. What do we do when people get up in front of the church? We ask them five questions. Number two, do you receive and rest upon Christ alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel? Him alone. And as this concept gets developed, the righteousness of God by which we're saved is not just God arbitrarily going, you're righteous. It's all because of the righteousness of Christ who obeyed the law flawlessly and it's counted to us and our sin counted to him. And this is going to be at the heart of what the gospel is all about as defended by the Reformation. So here we go. After 1517, Luther comes under the, um, under the eye of Rome. Johann Eck is one of the main apologists of the Roman church at this time. He'll, he'll end up in various disputes with Luther and with Zwingli, other German reformers. But he really does extract from Luther heresy when they have a, a formal debate. Luther uh, really gets pressed into this place where John Eck doesn't really care. I shouldn't say doesn't really care, but it's, it's clear that he's not as concerned about what the Bible actually says as to whether or not Luther is breaking church tradition. And he wants to get Luther to say specifically, Scripture is a higher authority than the Pope. Scripture is itself the highest authority in the church. That Scripture can contradict the Pope. And he's just, he just, Luther, you know, he's really pushing him in that direction. And Luther, he just can't stop. He's more of a stream of consciousness sort of speaker. And uh, it's just flowing out. And yeah, so he gets into a lot of trouble by asserting essentially scripture uninterpreted by the Pope is above the Pope. He, at this point, is pushed in his logic about purgatory to out and out denial of it and really pushed in the logic of what he said in the 95 Theses about penance to out and out denial of it. So when you ask who won the debate, well, the Protestants felt like Luther did. I mean, you know, those who would be Protestants because everything he said was defended with scripture. But if you're thinking about it as a legal defense and the law that's there, Luther condemns himself essentially and Eck leaves feeling like a rather accomplished man. He's ready to draw up um, condemnation papers at this point. And that's what they do. In 1520, there's a papal bull, which is just a decree, the exerge domine, um, 
by Pope Leo the Tenth, and it just it, what that means is arise, O Lord, and the rest of the sentence is and essentially you know arise, O Lord, and judge this blasphemer essentially, and that's what the document was. And Luther is given sixty days to recant or to be excommunicated, and um, what Luther does is he engages in a display of <laughs> bull burning, and he publicly burns the excurgate Domine on December tenth, uh, fifteen twenty, and um, that's kind of it. You know, when you, you burn, essentially, this, this decree is, with the total enmeshment of church and state, this is a, as much a civil crime as anything. And it's against the highest religious authority in the world. If you can imagine immediately, directly committing a crime against the president, that's what he's doing. And so this leads to, um, in 1517, the Diet of Worms, I meant to say 1521, Luther's gonna have to stand before the highest civil official in the world, the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. And it's there that Luther refuses to recant. And, you know, I think I've got the actual quote, but he, I mean, this is what he says, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in the councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves. I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. And these are the two principles of the, I mean, you have the principle of sola scriptura. You, I need to see where this is wrong via scripture. And what he's talking about now is his rejection of the penitential system in favor of a gospel that he has come to know through direct acquaintance with the Bible. And so the story goes that Luther is going to get killed. He's going to get killed for having done that. And on his return home, uh, the elector, Frederick the Wise, actually tells his men to go and stage a, 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 essentially some sort of a, um, a marauding band going about. And he steals Luther and hides him in Wartburg Castle, where Luther is hidden away from the rest of the world, saved by Frederick the Wise. And this is where you begin to see that the civil powers who actually save the reformers again and again. They're their biggest enemies, but it's the lesser civil powers who also um, are the protectors of the reformers and allow the reformation to occur. So there's always going to be a you know, unique relationship between the reformers and the lesser magistrates, as we're going to see. And this is... Uh, Wartburg Castle, that's really where he, he got sent. Not a bad place to be, I guess, you know. Uh, that's, that's where he is. But he's hidden away in Wartburg Castle near Eisenach in Thuringia, Germany. And um, so here's Worms. This is where it takes place. It's uh, down in, you know, mid to southeast uh, Germany. And I just, I love this map because it shows you what the German world looked like at that time. It is a universe of smaller kingdoms and duchies and this isn't even all of it, but this is how you can understand like a German prince who, the prince of Saxony, a relatively big region, it's kind of a big deal. And as these princes all over Northern Germany consolidate around the Lutheran cause, they become a, a really powerful force to be reckoned with for the um, Holy Roman Emperor in, in Austria. And so yeah, to Wartburg Castle he goes and get here. This is, he's there for a brief season, but as I noted earlier, things go crazy in Wittenberg. This is when the radical reformers start to go nuts. They start burning things down. They start breaking things. Don't get me wrong, being a reformed guy, I'm all about the second commandment, but I might question the wisdom of a mob of people simply going into a church and destroying everything. It's very hard to take that as an effort at reformation. Very easy to characterize that as a demonic mob, right? people going into churches and burning stuff down. And it's at this time when he returns to Wittenberg that he gets married in 1525 to Catherine von Bora. And she is uh, quite a woman herself. You know, Heather's reading a book right now called um, Feminists and Popes. And it discusses how, you know, anti-Christian, the whole worldview of the convent was women, you know, essentially leaving the household to go and live a life of austerity parallel to monks. And uh, one of the stories is Luther... He, 
he would just have vicious bouts of depression where he would lock himself in his room sometimes for days. And, um, you know, he, he, Luther, you know, blood and fire, man, this, he, that's what it was like living with him. And on one occasion, he locked himself in his room and, um, it, for days, and she had to go and hire a locksmith to open the door. And um, on another occasion, he locked himself in his room for a long time, and uh, she, she, she dressed up in all black and um, like a funeral was taking place. And when he came out, she's walking around in all black, really austere. And he's like, what's wrong? She's like, he's like, who died? And he's, she's like, God died. He's like, what? He's like, well, I figured that must have been what happened since you're sitting in your room just moping around all of the time. <laughs> and, and Luther, you know, she, so she, you had to be a special woman to, to be wed to Martin Luther. But um, many stories like that abound. Um, it's in this time where Luther has a debate with Erasmus. Remember him, the great scholar, Christian humanist, you name it. In uh, one of his most famous works, The Bondage of the Will, where Luther comes out as, you know, to speak anachronistically as an incredible Calvinist, um, arguing for um, the need for divine grace to bend our will before any man can, can believe in, in, in trust in Christ. Um, he opposes Karlstadt and Munzer, the radical reformers, and during the plague, he writes, A mighty fortress is our God. Do you guys know that when we sing that in church? It's Martin Luther hymn. And it was written amidst the plague, um, God being our fortress, um, not just against worldly powers, but against uh, sickness. So you, you keep that in mind. You sing that in church, right? It's Luther original. Now, when we think about the Reformation, we have to remember that Luther was not the only reformer in the universe. While Luther was doing his thing in the south of Germany, down in Switzerland, we'll see about this next time, Ulrich Zwingli was the center of peace and the, um, the heart and soul of the South German Reformation. And there, Switzerland and, and Germany um, kind of bled into each other. But he was centered in Zurich. And this guy, he was a bold reformer as well. We'll, we'll see next week. He was an out-and-out -out warrior, quite literally, um, for the cause of the Reformation in Switzerland. Well, here's the thing. When everyone's going back to the scriptures, back to the word, for their theology and for what they believe, you ought to expect that two men who are very charismatic um, would develop followings with slightly different nuances in theology. Right now in the PCA, you go to different PCA churches, you're going to get slightly different nuances in culture and preaching and Ultimately, what sorts of doctrines get preached regularly? You're going to get that. Well, you have that between, between Zwingli and, and Luther. And they, therefore, they put together this thing called the Marburg Quali Colloquy. I believe it was Martin Bucer who put it together. And the aim was to unite the South German reformers and the North German reformers so they have a united front against the empire and against any sort of civil powers that might be against them. Anybody know what uh, the big disagreement between Luther and um, Zwingli was? Anyone? Yeah, let's hear it, Seth. Yeah, that's right. Basically, Zwingli is going to be much closer to a concept of memorialism, that the Lord's Supper does not in any sense change in its uh, essential form into the body of Christ, whereas Luther is going to say that Jesus Christ's physical body is somehow present invisibly around, in with, under, surrounding the elements, his body and blood. This was Luther's theory. It gets developed and it, it receives the name consubstantiation. Now, I should be really clear, Zwingli was not a straight memorialist. He didn't just believe that this is something we're doing to remember Jesus. He did believe there's some spiritual efficacy in it, but he's really light on saying what that was. Well, the issue of the Lord's Supper will forevermore be the focal point of the disagreement between Lutherans and the Reformed. Even more than their views of predestination and things like that, this very practical matter of what's happening at the Lord's table is going to be the heart and the soul of, of, of their disagreement. It, it is to this day, and it's a really big deal. Technically, at a conservative Lutheran church, I, they would not commune me. It doesn't matter that I'm an ordained minister a Presbyterian minister, but because we have a different view on that. And I'm perfectly happy to say it's the body and blood of Christ, but 
fleshing out exactly what that means. I'm going to say it's rather mysterious. I, I think we preached a sermon you know, a while back on, on what we think about that. But my point is, this is a line in the sand. And Luther, at the Marburg colloqu- colloquy, he draws that line in the sand. Tell Zwingli we are not of the same spirit. It's pretty intense, dude. He tells him we're not of the same spirit. Most of the other Lutherans around, I mean, they're not called Lutherans at this point, but his camp are kind of like, you know, and they'll continue to have dialogues and discussions about this for years to come. But that really was what, what occurred. And here's what, what Zwingli says. He left, um, really sad, he left crying. He said, there are no people on earth with whom I would rather be at one than the Wittenbergers. He desperately wanted to be um, to have an allegiance there. And this, again, this points us to the fact, as we go through discussing, you know, church history, I just want to forewarn you, it is a sad story sometimes. Imagine if people took your life, put the whole thing under a microscope, if they wouldn't leave going, yeah, you know, he's a good guy, but shoot. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, that's what we're doing when we're looking at church history. We're looking at the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, not yet perfected, and you're going to have many moments where you go, ah, man, maybe the 30 years of war that killed an inconceivable, like one in every three Europeans might not have occurred if there had been a strong alliance between these two groups because the Holy Roman Empire might have thought it's too difficult to fight them. Who knows? But that's what Zwingli had to say, and it was all centered, sadly, on a doctrine of the Lord's Supper. I don't mean to discount how important that is, but I think we all feel a little bit of heartache that something couldn't have gotten worked out um, and even just a range of just of tolerance of opinion. But we move on to the Diet of Augsburg. This now is when the Charles, Charles V, the emperor, finds himself at war with the Turks in the south. And he really needs his whole empire to be unified to fight them. And you've got this whole Reformation thing going on. So he says to the North German peoples, gather here, let's work out our differences, let's come to agreement so that we can all be at one in this battle, essentially with the Muslims to the south who were at, uh, they they were making constant um, threats on Vienna. And so what ends up getting produced by these uh, North Germans and um, particularly the theologians they employ is the Augsburg Confession written by Luther's associate, Peter Melanchthon. And it's 21 positive articles. It's not very long. And part two is uh, an exposing of the church abuses that they're standing against. And it's the first Protestant confession of faith. Here's the thing. If you say the church is not centered in a person, not centered in the Pope, what is it centered in? We can say the Bible, that's great, but what does the Bible say? Can you tell me concisely? And hence began the age of writing church confessions. And that's because what we're going to say is that the church is centered around the gospel in the teaching of scripture. And what is that? Well, here it is. This is shorthand for what it has to say. And this is the first of the, the, of the Protestant confessions. And it's a plea for Protestantism, a bold plea to the emperor himself to receive Protestantism as the true and apostolic faith. And you look at how it even opens. Um, this is where the Diet of Augsburg takes place. By the way, great place to stay if you ever go to Germany. Close enough to Munich that you can drive in, but a little bit cheaper and a lot of history. Really good. Okay. My church history teacher told me that and I took his advice and it was a great idea. All right, but here's what it says. And this is a, a, a representation of the Diet of Augsburg. Anybody want to read that? Most invincible emperor, inasmuch as your imperial majesty has summoned a convention of the empire at Aus- Augsburg to deliberate in regard to aid against the Turk in order that things may be harmonized and brought back to the one simple truth and Christian concord, we were among the very first to be present. So Charles Melanchthon, Augsburg Confession, preface to Charles V. See what he says? Here's what we're here to do. We're not here to make a new religion. We're not here to invent something new. We're here to go right back 
to the one simple truth in Christian concord. It is very important as a Protestant you have this idea in mind. We do not view ourselves as producing a new religion. We view ourselves as recovering what was in the scriptures all the time. We view ourselves as recovering the simplicity of Christian practice. Early on, penance, as it's talked about the church fathers, is not a sacrament. It is actually a course of action that one had to take if they committed a heinous sin to be welcomed back into the fellowship so that you knew that they were serious. That's really what it was. You can imagine that if someone at Trinitas Church committed heinous acts, no need to go into details about there would be a much more strict course for what would have to take place to be brought back into the regular fellowship. Not because we're saying you couldn't possibly be saved, but because we're saying we're worried about you. That's what penance originally was. This is why he can say, look, we just want to go back to what, what, what the church was always doing. And um, it was ultimately allowed by Charles V. He allowed these German princes in the north to embrace the Augsburg Confession as their religion, but he didn't take to it as the course of the whole Holy Roman Empire. But this product by Peter Melanchthon, it really did make for the freedom and the allowance of this religion to flourish, and this is going to change the world from that point forward. In Luther's later years, and this is where we'll wrap things up, um, Luther completes his entire Luther Bible, um, along with his associates, both Old and New Testament. And even today, uh, if you guys know Hilary Marston, she, um, she, is, uh, she has a PhD in German. Like She went to, to Germany and, and lived there for a while. But I asked her what would be the best German Bible to get, and it's still a, a Luther Bible. And it's kind of like the King James, where you have New King James, and, but it's like, building on the work of the past. Well, it's still that way in Germany. If you want a conservative Bible translation as a German, you're going to get the most modern Luther Bible. I mean, look at that. 500 years of um, just blessing God's people. Um, Luther also wrote his own small confession or in the small, small called articles uh, where he was being asked for his views by another German prince. And um, it actually isn't adopted on Melanchthon's advice because Melanchthon, who was a little bit more measured, felt that Luther, well, he says some very inflammatory things in, in this particular work. I think I have an example. Here we go. Uh, part two, article four of the papacy. The Pope and devil himself, who intends to listen to nothing but merely when the case has been publicly announced to condemn, to murder, and to force us to idolatry. Therefore, we ought not here to kiss his feet or say, Thou art my gracious Lord, but as the angel in Zechariah 3, 2 said to Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. So you've called the Pope Satan and the devil himself a couple of times. And you know, this is probably how they all felt, but it was questionable whether you should put that into a church confession and then say, this is what we believe, and carry on with this for hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, so you can understand, and this is a picture, uh, a classic picture, the Pope, you know, led by all sorts of forces against Luther, and these are actually other uh, divines, um, you know, North German divines um, standing against him. And it kind of looks like Moses there, I think, a little bit, and I can imagine that was intentional. But here's another example, um, you know, in the, in the small called articles, it says, St. Augustine does not write that there is a purgatory, nor has he a testimony of scripture to constrain him thereto, but he leaves it in doubt whether there is one, and says that his mother asked him to be remembered at the altar or sacrament. He says, listen, you know, your references to the fathers, it's a, it's a passing thing in Augustine. He doesn't make it a doctrine, and you know, maybe some people thought there was you know, some superstition or idea, and he mentioned his mother asked that he, she'd be mentioned at the altar because of fear, but that's not the same as establishing a doctrine. And this is Luther, the mature Luther, completely rejecting the doctrine of purgatory. It's not biblical, and at best, you have passing references in the Fathers. It's nothing like this sacramental system. But you also have his mature assertion of the doctrine of justification of this article, justification by faith alone. Nothing can be yielded or surrender, surrendered, even though heaven and earth and whatever will not abide should sink to ruin. And you can see for Luther, this is the heart. And this is where we as Protestant people and Reformed people wholeheartedly agree with Luther. His most polemical writings get written later in life. And, you know, Luther later in life, he he got increasingly depressed and sad in his lifetime. 
I mean, when you look at the state of the world, you've seen how dark the church can be. You can see how powerful political might really is. Maybe some of you feel frustration at political power and might right now, and you feel like you can't do anything to change it. You just imagine being Luther. You're, why doesn't the Holy Roman Empire jump right on this and embrace it? And this can be the religion of the empire. What's his problem? And you just look at it and think, man, what could we possibly do? We've expounded the scriptures. We've explained it over and over again. This liberates people. And there's a religion that's still prevalent throughout the land, and especially in South Germany, Austria, that just crushes faith. You can imagine why the guy would be a little bit depressed. Well, he writes a few treatises, but some of them particularly inflammatory. 1538, Luther thinks, for goodness sake, if the gospel could just be explained really clearly and precisely to the Jewish people, they'd just, they'd receive their Messiah. And the Bible even says it, you know, in the scripture we read today, it'll be like life from the dead when they do. Well, I'm going to write a treatise to the Jews to just, to tell them about their king. And when you see how this religious community that's managed to be around for 1,500 years and not believe in Jesus uh, persists in not believing in him, it kind of unleashed the wrath of Luther. It should be very clear, it's not anti-Semitic, but it is very over-the-top anti-Jewish religion. Do you see the difference between those two things? There's, you know, you're evil because you have this ethnicity and this background and this, you know, genealogy. And this, you're really, really evil because you still are rejecting Jesus Christ as the Savior and you're under his wrath. Well, that was said 200 different ways with significantly more inflammatory language than what I'm using right now in his work against the Jews. And it's generally uh, considered one of the um, most inflammatory and um, problematic works of Luther just for the way he goes about dealing with that. In a way, um, you know, when you think about an unbelieving world and people being trapped in unbelief, well, you have to wonder at it as Christians and go, my goodness, you know, this is the, the hardness of the human heart. But there really isn't any point in railing against the unbeliever without end at their unbelief. I mean, it, it is what it is, and, and, and it's sad, and we should plead with them, but probably insult isn't going to get them much further. In, in their course and in their path. But then, of course, uh, one of his latest works is against the papacy at Rome and the institution of the devil. This also highly inflammatory. And one of the things I didn't talk about throughout this is just the political art that accompanied Luther. It, it's pretty intense, to be honest with you. This is, uh, when you go to um, Lutherstadt, Lucas Cranich, there's a whole, you can go to his studio, his art place, he was a very gifted artist, and he was the artist of the Reformation. This over here is the Pope birthing, being birthed by Satan. This is Pope coming out over here. And um, it was actually, it, this was a drawing that was made for against the papacy at Rome. And you can imagine that was a bit inflammatory at the time. There's all these demonic ladies who are, you know, nursing the Pope's children and bishops and things like that. And so, I mean, it was, you can imagine, pretty inflammatory. Um, they also lived in a highly superstitious world, and, and near Wittenberg, in the river, there was found a donkey whose flesh had um, kind of become scaly. It looked like a monster, and that's what they would call any deformed creature at that time. And it looked like it had the flesh of a human being from like here to here. It had really scaly skin like a fish, so it was the donkey-human uh, fish that they found. And people took it as ominous. And so... <laughs> this, was, this was taken as the inspiration for more art by Lucas Cranich called the Papal Ass. And it was apparently supposed to indicate both the true character of and the death of the papacy to come. And so uh, the papacy was represented as such by Lucas Cranich. And, you know, these things, again, you have the, the printing press, you have these, these means to get these sorts of pictures and drawings all over. So you flood Europe with stuff like this. I mean, this, these are fighting words to the Pope. And so you can see in Luther and in his story, this is, this is the end, but you can see, you know, some of the best and the worst of, of the Reformation. You know, it's hard to say. Could, there, could you have had a Luther who wasn't as inflammatory as he was? Could you have had a man, um, uh, a, a sinful human being, not Jesus who's, who's totally holy, 
could you have him take on the empire and the papacy and not be prone to depression and not be prone to these, you know, different fits and things like that? It's, it's a question you got to ask. You had men like Calvin, who you're going to see is significantly more refined. But guess what? Calvin didn't start the Reformation. <laughs> Calvin walked into the Reformation and was a great consolidator and a great developer and brilliant. But Luther was a unique man. You know, when you read later reformers, they'll speak about Luther and they'll describe him as an apostle. Not because they thought he was an actual apostle, but a man with a, a unique calling from God that is not everyone's calling. Um, you know, it's funny because, you know, I find that people who love, especially men who love theology, young men who love theology, we gravitate to Luther. <laughs> and there really is a very important sense that, like, there's only one Luther, man. Like, I'm not saying that there aren't battles for people to take up, but it's like, if you're going to take on the church like Luther took on the church, you've got to have a really, really, really good reason, like the gospel itself is at stake. And, um, and to be honest, it's not without wreckage in its path. It's not without incredible spiritual burden in its path. And um, this is the beginning of the Reformation. You, you can see the good things. You can see the cracks already there between the South German reformers and, and Luther, already there. And that's going to be one of the burdens that, um, that Protestants continue to deal with, that we have dealt with. And... Um, you know, it, it's the beginning of this long story. So any, any, any questions for me as, at the end of all of this? Yes? So you mentioned the cracks. There's been several attempts at mending relationships with Rome yeah. on both sides yeah. of the mm -hmm. um, any, any comments as yeah. to yeah. recent shots fired or, or just the, the yeah. inability still to get any kind of a totally. Absolutely. Is Rome does not budge on justification and does not budge on sola scriptura. Um, and they'd say the same thing to us as we don't budge on those things. Um, there's not going to be a reconciliation. And um, when I see these things, you know, you have these different, um, there's a statement, I think in the late 90s, where some, some of the Lutheran church, and I think there were a few Anglican representatives were there. But you read this statement and it's like, it's like reading a politician's statement where you're like, you're not answering the question. Like, you can all agree on this because it's highly ambiguous. Like, I mean, if that's what we're going for, you know, I mean, ambiguity, yeah. yeah, exactly. Ambiguity and ambiguity doesn't console a man's conscience when you're saying, how can I be right with God? And so I do see most of those efforts as, um, oh, man, just honestly, really badly misguided. Um, uh, I, I have to admit, I, I, I've not seen any fruit from it that I'm impressed with. It's noteworthy that in the lifetime of the Reformers um, and before the writing of the Council of Trent, there was a such council. And Melanchthon was there, Calvin was there as an advisor, and um, some pretty high-ranking Roman theologians were there too. And the fact is, the Roman theologians did bend way in the direction of justification by faith alone. But Rome said, well, that's not official. That doesn't count. And at the end of the day, what they did didn't matter because they went on to write the Council of Trent with all of its anathemas to people who believe what we believe, which is a statement which means damnation to hell. It's like anyone who says what we believe. So to be honest with you, until Rome literally removes those anathemas, that's their formal and official statement on it. And they've never removed those things. How difficult is it because they have Yeah. <clears throat> In a way, I would say it's not nearly as difficult as it used to be because Rome is so much more Protestant than it was to begin with for practical purposes. And let me just, in the, in the basic ways, number one, you're going to go and hear a, a, a homily in English. Like, <laughs> that is so much more Protestant than 15th century Rome. It's insane. So let's just say you even heard the scriptures read. All you did was hear the scriptures read in John 3, 16, whosoever believes in me shall have everlasting life. And you happen to be sitting in church and you took that in that day and, you know, you missed everything else. I mean, here's the thing. The word of God is powerful to save. So if you're asking me if, like, I think some people, you know, can be saved in a Roman church. Yeah, I do, because you could hear the word of God in your language there. 
Um, and, you know, the, the fact is as well that often, I would just say, this is something of a caricature, but, but, but it plays true. It played true in my dad's experience when his family went into a cult. But, like, there actually isn't the expectation that a Roman priest would be a super incredible theologically versed individual because what they're, they are, they're sacerdotalists who believe that what I'm doing is giving you grace by the sacrament. So my capacity to be a profoundly good exegete or apologist for Rome is not really essential to what I am or what I do. So that means that a lot of people in, uh, who'd be preaching in a Roman church wouldn't even necessarily be privy to the, the need to defend Roman doctrine. And you might potentially just hear of Christ at the same time. I mean, the, the hard part about it is Rome is such a mixed bag. You could go to a Roman Catholic church that is fundamentally pro-choice in every way progressive in its sexual ethic. I mean, it's just, you'd be like, is there anything Christian about this? There, there are absolutely Roman churches like that, where I'd be just as worried about anyone there as somebody, you know, attending a leftist, you know, political rally. I mean, and I sadly could say the same thing about, you know, the whole PCUSA and churches in, in that tradition too. So good question though, Ben, really good question. But I, I would just say, yeah, I, I definitely have hope that people really do meet Jesus um, in, uh, in Roman Catholic churches. Um, but I would, I'd be really reluctant to just be like, oh yeah, they're good, they're with us. Or I wouldn't say that. I'm not even reluctant. I just wouldn't say that. I'd say I'm worried about, about what's going on in a Roman Catholic church. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And I honestly think that there's something to that. Like, mm-hmm. you know, Calvin's good. He's systematic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he can also be a little bit boring. Yeah. Honest. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons why people like Luther so much is just oh, yeah. there, there is something attractive about the way he writes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I agree that shouldn't go too far, but I think right. there's a sense in which the, like the, sat, the satire is the point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, some people are like, oh, that was kind of unnecessary. No, I really had a point in kind of poking fun at her about mm-hmm. this. Like, this is really serious. Like, you're yeah. rejecting, you know, she grew up Christian, you're rejecting God. It's really going to have serious consequences. So, yeah. I, I, you know, can you go too far with that kind of thing? Like, what, what, what can we learn from him? Yeah. Um, you know, we, we can go too far. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's kind of the question that every, you know, uh, comedian is asking today. Like, what can you actually make a joke about? And um, it will forever be the question when it comes to satire and when it comes to humor and you name it. And if there were any, like, scientific way to say where that line was, then, I mean, no one would ever cross it. But that's kind of it. I mean, because the more ridiculous, it, it, the more funny and also potentially the more offensive and inflammatory. Um, there are some specifics I think, you know, you can put out there that, um, part of it is just who are, I think inevitably as you are talking to more people, it is harder to, in, to utilize humor in a way that even most people will appreciate. It takes a real supernatural gift, um, and maybe people don't like that word, but a real gift to actually be able to make a good point and be funny to a vast swath of people. Uh, it just takes an, a, a sort of intelligence that um, not most people have. And so, you know, Luther, and then you ask yourself, who are you talking to? If Luther's decided his audience is essentially the common Christian man, and he doesn't, he's ready to, to embrace the consequences of what the aristocracy and the papacy is, you could say, well, then he's always hitting a bullseye. <laughs> But even Luther is having to admit at certain points in his career. That's why he'd say things like, you know, Melanchthon, you're actually a more precise theologian than me. He'd tell other people that. Um, Because that's the thing. I mean, Luther would, nobody would say that Luther, his primary gifting was precision. Um, 
you, there are many theologians you'd put way above him on that front. But at the end of the day, you, you simply have to admit that it was a powerful part of what he did, and he probably would not have been Martin Luther. And I think I dare say there probably would not have been a Reformation if he hadn't engaged in the very sorts of things that you're saying. And it just, it's what made him a force. He was just a charismatic force to be reckoned with. It's a great question, Seth. I wish I could give you a better answer than to say, yeah, it's true. It was really powerful. And it got him into a lot of trouble. So he's like the Donald Trump of uh, the Reformation. I knew someone would say it. Scott asked if he was the Donald Trump of the Reformation. Yes, that's exactly right. That's what he was. No. <laughs> sure, I and mean, he kind of was. But um, yeah, favorite Luther insult? My goodness, mm. Mm. that's a good question. I don't know why. I mean, I had the you know whole list of them, and I don't know why none are coming to mind right now. Um, but no, I suppose that's probably not the thing that I remember most about Luther. <laughs> no, uh, the fact is, yeah, I've, I, in terms of my theological reading, I've read the main Luther texts you know, bondage of the will, commentary on Galatians, his four treatises that usually get lumped together, written right after the 95 Theses to the German peasants, and, you know, uh, Christian liberty, you name it. But um, I've read so much more Calvin and <laughs> the other reformers that it's, it, he's probably not the focal point for me. Anyone else? What happened with the Jewish uh, question? Oh, just, I mean, what do you mean? Well, yeah. Apparently, he he was looked with favor uh, to the Jews until they basically rejected his overtures to. Yeah, we talked about it. I mean, the whole point was is Luther thought perhaps that they were driven away for the same reason that many Christians were that Rome had kind of weighted down Jesus. They'd hidden him behind all these sacraments and a vast. Um, you know, church hierarchy. If we could just get Jesus to the Jews, they'd be good. And turns out, this many of the Jews had heard about Jesus, and they weren't they weren't ready to to bite. And that is kind of a disturbing thing that we all discover sometimes. I always put that out there for people when we do missions and like, you know, we really want to reach this people. It's like, well, okay. Paul really wanted to reach his countrymen. Just read his letters, and the Lord was like, you'll be reaching these people. I mean, this is Jonah. This is classic in the Bible. And it really does make me raise an eyebrow of suspicion. It's one of the things that kind of frustrates me when people are like, you know, we should have, you know, multi-ethnic churches. Like, that's a great thing to hope for. But I'll just tell you as a church planter, I have like this much power to determine who's in my church. Like, <laughs> almost none. Fact is, this is really the way things work in America. You tend to get what you have. That's why for the first five, six years of our church plant, we had nothing but 30-somethings with children from zero to three, and it was a zoo. I mean, it still kind of is, but dude, it was just, because that's what you get. You get people who are like, oh, I'm 30-something. I have, you know, two kids under the age of three, and this is the church for me, and it's like, <laughs> yeah, there's no power to say, you know, we're going to have this particular group of people here, and I actually do worry about missions that will often be like, you know, I want to go into Portland and reach inner city, whatever, yeah. and it's like, you, what, you know your mission plan really should say? I'd like to reach the Pharisees. That's what people who are wealthy in, you know, social, you know, stock and wealthy potentially, you know, in money. And it's, that's a very hard group of people to reach. Not to say you can't, but it's, it's difficult to have a focused mission. And, and Luther, I think that's where it's one of the lessons you get from that. You can, you can really want to reach a people and have God say, no, the door's not open right now. And think about your own family members. I guarantee everybody in this room has a family member. You're like, I'd really like to reach them for Jesus. And for some reason, they're not listening. Well, let's call it for now, just so that you guys can all get home. We went late. And uh, blessings. And um, yeah, we'll see you guys at the beginning of um, December because we're going to skip Thanksgiving week. I know you're busy. <laughs>